Today we launch a new series woo, called Next Level Relationships. Let's get awkward, right? It's going to be awesome. I want to set us all at ease. This is for everybody, and I'm going to explain why it's for everybody. It's not just for married people. It's not just for single people who want to be married. It is for everybody. But before we get into that, uh, apparently there is a well-known college basketball coach who is, uh, shall we say, retiring. And this year, evidently, all of the rivalry games are taking on new uh, meaning, new passion, new, new energy to them, and they're all sold out. Everybody wants a ticket, right? Like, oh, I got to get there. You know, you could sell it for big bucks. You know, family members are like coming out of the woodwork like, hey, you live in North Carolina, can I come see? You know, you're like, I don't even know you. <laughs> these, are, these are expensive seats. These are great tickets. And evidently, the story goes, there was a man spotted sitting courtside at the very front row with an empty seat beside him. And the people are just, even the commentators evidently are just zooming in like, this is incredible. What are, how could he not fill that seat? What is the story? And as the story goes, the man tapped him behind him and said, listen, I, I noticed that you have an empty seat beside you. What is that all about? And the man just blew him away. He said, that was my wife's seat. And she recently passed. And we had season tickets and she never missed a game. And that man felt so foolish for even thinking otherwise. Says, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry for your loss. And he sat back for a minute and he says, I, I, gotta, I, can't, I can't help it. I got to know. Why would you not give that to somebody? Give it to a family member or a close friend to come enjoy this historic game. And he says, oh, I tried, but they're all still at her funeral. So we... <laughs> <laughs> may not be a great example of a good relationship. If that's how you feel about your spouse, who has, God rest his soul, gone on to be with the Lord, we have issues. Today... We're going to address some of these issues. It's going to be today, Wednesday night, next Sunday, and next Wednesday night. Okay, four sessions. The Wednesday night ones are going to be more adult-oriented, okay? So it's going to get, like, less awkward but more awkward. Just so you know, kids will be over there. Today we're looking at relationships. More importantly, what does this book have to say about relationships? Because this is the standard. And I want to say it again. This is the standard. Not my opinion, not your opinion, not the culture's opinion, not Satan's opinion. God's opinion is what matters, okay? We're going to stand on that, and we're going to let it fall where it falls. And if it hurts me, so be it. If it hurts or cuts you, so be it. If we are going to be disciples of Christ, if we are going to call ourselves followers, that's what Christian means, little Christ, following him, then we have to be unashamedly people of the book. That makes sense? Everybody with me so far? Today, it is no secret that the state of the family, the state of marriage, the state of relationships, the state of sexuality is not healthy. It's not good. It's not good. <laughs> you can just look around, turn on the news, Clark. You'll see it. It's in shambles. And the heartbreaking thing is those who claim to follow Christ roughly parallels those who don't. Divorces are up, especially from our parents' generation. Unwed pregnancies, way up. Broken homes, up. Cohabitation numbers, up. Children born out of wedlock to that, way up. Childbirths among married couples who follow the Lord are down. Now, that's the first mandate God gave us. Do you know that? He said, be fruitful and multiply. He was counting on us to be the ones who go forward, who spread the knowledge of the Savior. And the sobering part is even among professing believers... The state of marriage and the health of the family has now roughly mimicked secular culture as a whole. And that's not good. So the truth is, our opening truth is this. Many people have settled for something that is less than God's ideal. Several good people in my family, and probably in yours, have settled for something that is less than God's ideal. Okay? We're going to look at what God's ideal is. It doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean they're evil. But it does mean we have deviated from what God's holy standard. Okay, so if you're here today or you're listening online, you may feel like you have fallen short of God's standard. You probably have. <laughs> Relax. We all have. It's okay. Hear me. This is, I declare that you are in good company. This is a judgment-free zone. All right? I want you to hear that and relax. Only this book has the authority to judge. Okay? 
So everybody sit back, breathe easy. I see the nervousness on your face. It's not going to get that awkward today. All right, I'm saving that. This is the judgment, okay? So to start us off, I want to put something up. The goal of this series is simply this, to remind us all what God's standard is so that we can remember what we're aiming for. That makes sense? The goal of this whole series, even though it's a mini-series, is to know what this says, and this is the high holy standard. If you're shooting arrows, this is what you're going for, okay? That's the whole goal. It's not about my opinion. It's not about yours. It's not about what my family thinks or your family thinks. I am to the point, I want to be so committed to the Lord, I don't care what the world says. Don't you want that? Don't you want to be to that point? It's so freeing. But everything, and hear me, must be contained in love. Everything we discuss, everything we share. So it begins with understanding family, relationships, sexuality. All this is God's idea, and it is good. Our job this couple days is to get a good handle on this. We want to get a grip on what God's Word says about all these topics. I was telling Jason, I almost called this series Love Handles because it was so important, you know, like, we got to get a grip on sexuality. But I didn't think you wanted to look at a chubby guy grabbing his love handles the whole time behind me while we were going through this. Marriage and family was created by God. It is the cornerstone for society. It's not up for definition, not up for debate. The family is God's idea to provide us all a refuge, a safe place, a stability place where you can come and safe be with your own family members. So today we're going to start with the original power couple, Adam and Eve, all the way back in paradise, in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2. What a lot of people miss was while this was an awesome power couple, they had struggles. And it came a little bit late. Once sin entered the picture, I love how Lisa Bevere put it. She said this, marriage was never meant to be a power struggle. It was meant to be a power union. Isn't that great? I love this. I mean, let's be honest. Most marriages struggle from time to time. No family's perfect. The older you get, the more the... More the, the you know what I'm saying. Hey, you, you've got family members that come out of the woodwork. No marriage is perfect. No relationship is perfect. Some of us, man, we put the funk in dysfunctional. And we, we wear it proudly. Look at this. When it comes to our relationships, every one of us have blown it. Hear me, that is okay. We have to admit that. We have to confess that freely to the Lord. We are all imperfect uh, vessels. We're broken. But thankfully, we serve a God who specializes in rebuilding that which was broken. Adam and Eve were the only ones who could claim they had a perfect marriage. That's it. They're the only ones. Think about it. There were no comparison traps. She couldn't compare and talk about the cute quarterback living over on the other side of Eden. She might have married and fantasized about what it would be like. He couldn't talk about the cute cheerleader wearing the little leopard skin thing, whatever, on the other side of the Euphrates. I just married Hilda over there. They didn't have to worry about in-laws. Roy Shaver came. Where's Roy? See, there he is. Roy shared a joke years ago, and every time we talk about family, I share it because it just doesn't get old. He says, Matt, you know what the difference is between in-laws and outlaws? Outlaws are wanted. <laughs> Man. If any in-laws are watching, we love everybody. There's no, this is, this, it's just a joke. Adam and Eve were the only couple in history not to know anyone who came from a broken home. Think about this. Think about what it must have been like to walk with the Lord God in the cool of the day. To talk with him. Just as clearly as I see Corey and just talk with him. Hey, we're going to walk in the cool of the day. They had unbroken fellowship and even they failed so if you're beating yourself up about your past release it today is not about that they're the only ones who could claim to have a perfect marriage even if it was for a sh short while they didn't have to fight over who gets the kids on thanksgiving they didn't have to fight where do we go on christmas they didn't even have to fight, figure out who gets to talk about the crazy uncle when he shows up uninvited and we have that awkward moment where Cousin Eddie's on the thing, he's supposed to come for a day and he ends up staying a month. No family's perfect, no relationship is perfect. But God does not release us from his standard for love, for healthy relationships, for biblical sexuality. 
As we dive in, I want to give you a disclaimer, and this is critically important, okay? I want you to hear everything said these next four sessions is couched in coming from love, okay? So if you have been a part of a bad relationship, or you are coming out of a tough previous marital situation, or maybe you've got a rough family dynamic at the home, and that is in your past, and you have moved forward with the Lord, and you've sought healing and forgiveness where necessary, Today is not about that. We are all pressing forward in him. Okay, so breathe easy. Today is for everyone. Ain't none of us got it all together. This is for all of us. In the immortal words of Clark Griswold, oh, oh no, no, we all in this together, okay? This is going to be for all of us. So here's the historical context for what we're about to read. Chapter 1 walks us through the days of creation leading up to the scripture today. And God looks at everything and he says one phrase over and over. It is good. It's all good. I made this. It's good. I made that. It's good. I made that. It's good. It's good, okay? So if you're new to the faith, we're leading up to this. this if you're checking out Christianity, here's what's happening to what we're about to read. The Lord God has created an absolutely gorgeous, perfect, Edenic paradise. It is flawless. It is good. In fact, everything he creates, he declares good. So the Lord God took Adam, and he places him in the garden, and he gives him a command. I need you to tend to this and keep it. This is going to be your place to steward. The first words the Lord says after that is, uh-oh, not good. Something was lacking. It's the first time he says this. And it's very strange. You read, good, 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 good. Adam, no, no, not good. Hmm. And that's where we pick up the story. Read with me, starting in Genesis 2, 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, he closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, this is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man because she was taken out of man. Therefore... A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become 50-50. Oh. oh, wait, that doesn't say that. They shall become one flesh. Did you catch something strange there? The, one of the whole reasons that God created Adam and Eve to be together was because Adam and, Adam's aloneness, it, it wasn't good. His words, not mine. This is huge. This is a huge contrast to everything he set up to that. It's good, it's good, it's good. Everything's very good. And right here from the very beginning, we see this huge biblical truth. Relationships are huge to God. They are part of his basic design for humanity. His basic design. Okay? You're not a cosmic accident. You're not a mistake just kind of meandering around, just making your way. He has a plan. He came up with this. His world, his rules, his plan. What's so sad is this day and age, we have to even go over the basics of God's original plan. But we do. This is where we are. So we'll do it. We'll do it in love because no longer is this being held up as God's standard. But it doesn't excuse us from knowing it. No longer is this being taught. Not only in schools. It's not being taught in a lot of churches. No longer is this something where you just assume the general populace understands and kind of knows. Eh, even if I don't agree with it, yeah, at least I know it. That's not the norm anymore. You are abnormal, and that's okay. We're not called to blend in. We're allowed to stand out. We're allowed to be light in the darkness. So what is God's ideal plan for his children? Well, according to his word, very clearly, marriage is ideally a relationship in which each spouse brings true and complete holy companionship to the other. I'm going to walk you through five things, okay? According, and I love David Jeremiah puts it like this. He says this. We see very clearly here in Genesis God's design for relationships. His design for marriage and the family is to begin with, first, a blessed and a holy lifelong union between one man and one woman. His ideal goal is for it to be a permanent union between husband and wife that will serve as the principal building block for a stable society. Okay, That's the goal. That's what we're shooting for. It's meant to provide a spiritual, emotional, and physical unity. And most people eliminate the first one there. Did you see that? Spiritual. Unity. 
People want to skip over that and just reduce it down to the simple base sexuality. That's not how God made it. The third thing is designed to literally sustain the human race with the procreation of children in a safe and stable environment. Now, some people get that. They say, okay, it's biology 101, it's science, I get it. Parts fit together, that's how life, I get it. But they stop there. That's only half the story. You are missing the spiritual element. You're missing the whole covenant of marriage. It is sacred. It is awesome. It's not supposed to be denigrated. It's supposed to be elevated. So many people leave out this part because they just want to look at it from a secular or a sexual viewpoint only. But the spiritual component is huge. God's design for marriage is also to be a foreshadowing of his relationship with Israel. Secular science doesn't get that. The liberal brainwashed America doesn't get that. Only if you take the Bible seriously and interpret it with a conservative viewpoint and say, I'm going to allow God's word to say what it says and mean what it means here. I'm not going to water it down. I'm not going to inject my opinion into it because my opinion can change. I'm going to look at it and see what it says. But not only is it about Israel, it reflects Christ's relationship with us, with the church. Never forget this. He is called the bridegroom for a reason. You are called the bride of Christ for a reason. He is coming back for you if you're part of his family. We read that. He is coming back. This thing, family titles were huge to the father. He chose the name father, and he uses terms like son. He calls us the, the bride of Christ. It is so big to him. So God has a definition. He has an ideal plan, and his word is clear. But something happened. If you read on, you see in the very next chapter, the tempter, Satan, the old snake, makes his appearance in the form of that deceptive serpent. The old snake himself makes his debut and shows up and is about to change everything. Y'all remember that creepy story in the news? I know some of you are going to hate this, but i got to share it. You know, I, I talked about it once before, and I saw a lot of people squirming. But if you didn't hear it, I'll just hit the highlights. There was a lady, true story, named Kelly Swisher in Arkansas, minding her own business, just driving down Interstate 49. When out of the blue, a rat snake fell out of her dashboard and slithered across her feet while she had her foot on the gas pedal. What would your reaction be to that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see it right there. <laughs> right? It'd be my reaction if I pulled down the visor and seven brown recluse spiders fell and just crawled over me, right? You would not be talking to me. I would have wrecked. Miraculously, Kelly Swisher didn't wreck. I don't know how she did it, but she had the composure to calmly pull over get out of the vehicle, call the authorities. They came, they removed the snake, and she was able to continue on without further incident. Here's the point. Why would I share that? Because in a spiritual sense, that happens to us all the time. You don't know when the devil's going to drop in and try to tempt you away from your spouse. You don't know when something's going to come up and you're going to be, whoa, off course or jerked out of what you were thinking was going to happen and your life took a turn, the devil can drop in any time. We never know when we'll have an incident with the old serpent. He lurks around. He drops in out of nowhere. He's there to tempt you, to test you, doing his best to destroy you, your relationships, to rob you of purity, to rob you of peace. I mean, guys, the family, your marriage, kids, they are under assault. Eyes wide open, church. We can't afford to bury our head in the sand. The enemy hates the truth that is found in this word. The biblical standards that you grew up with, that you assumed everyone knew, are no longer held up in high regard. They are under assault. The devil is distorting. He is perverting so much. We're going to go into a lot of this Wednesday night. So adults, whether you're single, single again, married, or hope to have a relationship, don't miss Wednesday night, okay? I'll, I'll share a little bit about that at the end of the service. But let's just suffice it to say, your marriage is under assault. Your kids are under assault. If you are not grounding them in this, it's open season. It's open season. Y'all, my kids, we do our best to have them grounded in this, and I can see the effects of the world on great kids come asking questions. They are being confused about things they shouldn't be confused about. And some things are even being forced or celebrated, and they're coming home going, Dad, I don't understand. So, guys, I'm just going to say it. God's word is not silent on these issues. We are. 
And that stops today. We have a duty to stand up and say, this is right, this is wrong. Doesn't mean I hate you. Doesn't mean you're not loved. Just means you might be confused about things that God is very clear about. So let me ask you a few questions here. Can you, if you had to, correctly and biblically explain God's best for humanity? If somebody were to come up to you and say, hey, you know, I'm confused. I'm hearing this, and I'm seeing that, and I'm reading that, and I saw that. And, mm. What does God's word say? Could you succinctly, remember the elevator pitch, right? You get on the elevator, you got 30 seconds to tell the CEO your great idea that's going to save the company. By the time those doors open, you better have been able to succinctly share the deal. Can you do that? Can you lovingly and gently answer any questions that the next generation has? the ones that are growing up without any guardrails? Can you provide that, that, that stable and loving interaction, that conversation to point them to God's definition of a healthy marriage? Can you confidently and lovingly point to God's ideal standard when secular media is trying to say, that's not true, that's outdated, you're, you're just, ugh, what a nerd. Can you? Well, I hope you can, because the world is out to rob you of truth, peace, Purity? Standard? I mean, it's, it's incredible. What I can't even imagine. If the Lord holds back his return, I can't even imagine what the next generation is going to face. It already makes my head spin. How about you? I look around, I see these things. The church can't afford to be silent. If I were to ask you, what is the state of your relationship with your spouse right now? What would you say? Don't answer out loud. All right? How well do you relate to them? Do you know what makes them tick? Do you know what makes them ticked off? Right? Do you know how to, you know how to pull it back from that? Yeah. How well are the two of you? Front row needs to just be quiet during this right here, just so <laughs> sake, because there's a microphone above your head. Uh, how well would you say the two of you are communicating right now? Okay, we're going to dive into a little bit of this and look at, look at some, some keys here and expand on it in, in the coming time. Communication is absolutely critical, not only to communicate love, but to communicate and control conflict. From time to time, you will hear me reference one of my favorite books, a great best-selling book called The Five Love Languages, Gary Chapman wrote. If you haven't read it, you need to go read it. There is a test that you can take. It's online. It's free. It is fun. Get your spouse, get your significant other together and go through this because it is so revealing. You will laugh. You will go, oh, that's you. Oh, no, that's me. No, that's not, that's not you. Uh, wish it was, right? And you're going through these things, and it will reveal so much. If, if you're not sure, I won't go through it all, but here, here's the five love languages. The first one is the words of affirmation, okay? I'm going to relate it to things food-related so that you can understand. And I'm hungry. I'm always hungry, so I'm going to relate it to my favorite, to tacos, okay? So if you were going through, words of affirmation might sound something like this. Oh, your tacos are delicious, Okay? That's words of affirmation. If your love language was acts of service, you might say, I made you tacos. Okay? Is that, you see how this fits? If it was receiving gifts, you might say, here's a taco. Okay? Very simple. If it was quality time, you would say, hey, let's go out and get tacos together. But my favorite one, if it's physical touch, which a lot of us is, it would be, uh, let me hold you uh, like a taco. Okay? <laughs> right? You see that? You feel that? All of you feel that. It resonates, right? Because you just want to cuddle up with a taco. This is, this, okay, I knew we would all get this if I related this to food. And I, I read a great I, a article um, about relationships called Marriage Isn't About Your Happiness by Deborah Felita. And in this article, she asked another food-related question. She says, hey, did you ever think someone could show you love with a bologna sandwich? Well, that headline intrigued me. I read it. It's just a couple sentences. It said this. I didn't think so either until I found out that my then boyfriend, now husband, who was a poor medical school student in debt at the time, spent close to two months very quietly eating nothing but bologna sandwiches every single day in order to cut down his grocery budget to, wait for it, $10 a week. He did that just so he could save up enough money to buy me an engagement ring to ask me to be his forever partner. The truth is, a healthy marriage will cost you. It should cost you. When you think of cost, you think, oh, okay, yeah, it's expensive, and most of us just think about the wedding expense, and I looked at it this week. It is up to 31000 just for the wedding. 
Who are these people? I mean, that's crazy. Look at this. Photographer, 2,500. Wedding planner, right? Ceremony, 602 favors. And nowhere do I see on there the pastor who married him. He gets a gift card to Starbucks, 25 bucks. You wouldn't even have a wedding without... Okay, whatever. I'm just... No, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. But it's nothing compared to the real cost of being a follower of Christ who wants to love your spouse with unconditional love. When you look at Jesus, when you imagine what Adam and Eve went through, it will cost you everything. It'll be much larger than that price tag you see. It will cost you yourself. And this is where society has missed it. This is where we have turned inward and we have become so self-focused. Recently, a married man, a famous celebrity on TV, I'm not going to use his name because we're not here to throw mud on anybody or, or hurt people's character, but a famous celebrity was asked this question, hey, do you think you're going to stay in your marriage? To which this was his actual reply. I shouldn't be with somebody if I'm not happy. See it? One word jump out at you there? <laughs> I, right? I shouldn't be with somebody if I'm not happy. And there it is. This is the accurate reflection of so many in our country. We're so me-focused. We're so self-centered. This is the society, everyone believing that their main goal in life is their own personal happiness. Do we see that anywhere in this as our guide? Do we ever see Jesus walking around going, <laughs> I'm not happy. You know, I'm not going to the cross. That hurts. That's not for me. You want to talk about sacrificial love. Think about what he does. I mean, this is such a small, shallow, unbiblical way to live. If you are getting married and you have that as your main goal, to make yourself happy, you will be so disappointed. Like within 45 minutes of saying I do, you will be <laughs> disappointed. Trust those of us who are giggling about this. Marriage is not about your happiness. That is a lie. It's not about that. Should you be happy? It's gonna, you're going to have happiness. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. I'm not trying to say it's bad. But don't go in blindfolded thinking that it is going to be about your happiness. It's really not even about you. You want to have a great, healthy relationship? It's about love and sacrifice. When you look at the Gospels and you see what Jesus is talking about, something we choose to give time and time again is ourselves, a love and sacrifice. That's the central message in the good news. Look at John 3.16. I mean, it's right there. He declares to everyone, God so loved the world that he took. No, he gave. We, we see love and gave in the same sentence. This is the gospel. He gave his very most precious thing, his son. He didn't hold anything back. Then you want to talk about sacrifice. That's not an accident, right? That's our example. So you don't got to ask. <laughs> How are you doing loving your spouse like that? Yeah. You're listening online. It's really quiet in here, right? Because this is our standard. Not me, not you, not your feelings. Oh, you know how I feel about feelings. Mm. Feelings. Change like the wind, man. I've heard it said that marriage will teach you more in five minutes about selfishness and selflessness than anything else. And it is so true. And maybe you found that in your own relationship because at the heart of it, real love is about sacrifice. It's about giving of yourself in big ways and small ways. That's why a healthy marriage will cost you. All right? So, Pastor, what does that mean? What does that look like in everyday life? You know, I love to bring it down. I want to be practical. I want you to think about this in your own day-to-day. -day. How does that look in real life? Well, for one thing, loving sacrificially is about offering forgiveness to somebody who has hurt you. Roll that around your head for a second. I had this happen to me just 24 hours ago. Somebody very close cut me deep. No, we're fine. We fix it. Those apologies, forgiveness, no problem. Move forward. True love is about offering forgiveness when you've been hurt. How else does it look? It's about giving your time when it's not convenient. Ugh, I hate that one. I'll give him my time? I can't get that back, man. I know I'm getting older. Y'all getting older too. Don't just look at me like, yeah, you are, right? This is it's about giving your time when it's not It's about sharing your heart when you'd rather hold back. <coughs> Men. 
right? You got to do it. It's about cleaning the kitchen or, or, or the bathrooms or the garage when it's your least favorite thing to do. And you surprise your spouse with that. You don't understand. I hate it. I know. And that's exactly why it's sacrificial. That's why we do it. It's about choosing to respond with love when your gut reaction is to respond with anger. Even if it was justified anger. Oh, man. That's a tough one. So easy to justify a righteous indignation, isn't it? Hide behind that. I'm not angry. I'm righteously indignant. Bull. <laughs> you angry. And you probably crossed the line into sin. That's the standard. Sometimes it's not about talking. It's actually about offering a listening ear. Like maybe you need to just be quiet and listen when everything in you just wants to tune her out or roll over in bed and go to sleep. Or maybe you would just rather talk and talk and talk and explain and defend yourself. Uh, if you could just please stop talking, that would be great. It's not about giving um, your preferences over theirs. In fact, it's about giving up that last bite so that your spouse can enjoy it. I know, Milo, right? It's tough. True story. True story. Good friend of mine. I got to watch him go through the courtship ritual find a fiance and get married. And I loved hearing their dating stories. You know this person, I'm not mentioning names. They're not in the room, okay? So don't, don't be looking and pointing. <laughs> they were out to eat several times. And the man in this relationship loved to cut off the best parts of his meal, slide them to the far side of the plate and save them for last, okay? It was how he, in his mind, could choke down the broccoli and the junk, and the salad, all that horrible stuff, so that he knew he had something great to look forward to at the end. His fiance, who was just getting to know him, would see that sitting there, and take her fort, and would just, <laughs> oh, what's that? Hmm. Assuming he's leaving it because he can't get to it, right? The men are from Venus and Mars, right? We're just totally, finally, after like the third date, he just puts his fort down and says, why do you do that? Stop it. Well, stop what? Said, I was trying to help you. Said, I am saving that for my finale. That is what I'm looking for. I'm looking to it. And every time you do it, a little piece of my soul dies. Right? It's like, you just took the only bite of tiramisu that was going to get me through broccoli. You know? I don't think this marriage is going to work. But, right? It's about giving up the last bite of tiramisu so your spouse can enjoy it. Even if you look with a tear in your eye as they eat it. It's about giving up that hand massage that you feel great about so that you can give a painful back massage to your spouse because they always say, harder, harder, and it hurts. And now you got to go back to your chiropractor and get everything adjusted. Right? Sacrifice. It's about putting someone else's needs and desires before you. Man, I could go on and on, but it always ends with this same magic formula. Are you ready? Three words, write this down. We before me. Okay? We before me. If you really want to take it to the next level, you'll get to the point where it's the before we. Think of it as a triangle. The Lord's here. You're here. Your spouse is here. You want to go closer together? Grow closer to him, and you'll find yourself together. It's God's standard. This is what, y'all, a healthy marriage, it should cost you. It will cost you. So we're going to pray about that today, okay? We're going to end uh, a little early because we've got a little surprise at the end that I, I want to share and let Missy share some, some neat stuff. I'm going to call our musicians up. As they get in place, I want to close with this. With eyes wide open, we have to realize the world despises the sacrificial side of love. They will constantly tell you it is about you. The culture will tell you you strive for control, you take the upper hand in your relationship, but that's not what God says. They will tell you if it feels good, do what feels right, don't tolerate anything else. They will fool us into thinking that love is about doing what makes us happy. And the second we feel anything less than happy, you will see some encouragement. Eh, you might have made a bad choice. Why don't you just bail? Why don't you abandon shit? Why don't you stop investing? Why don't you give up on love? Okay? That's what the culture says. As we pray in just a moment and as we see Wednesday and Sunday and next Wednesday, the culture is wrong. Here is your challenge. When you come up with things this week, I want you to notice if you choose Christ 
over the culture. Okay? This is the filter we are going to look at for the remainder of the series. Christ says the more we give, the better we become. Scripture teaches us real love isn't self-seeking. It's always about the other person. It's always about the Lord. It's always about sacrifice. It should cost you more, more, and more, again and again. If it's not, your assignment is to look within this week till we meet again and say, is this about me? Have I been putting their needs first, or has this really been about me? Have I just been so blinded that I've just done what everybody's doing, focusing on me. The problem with that is, it's not what Jesus models. Real love is 100% worth any sacrifice. There is good news coming. For those of you, if you're struggling, there is a redeemer who specializes in restoring things that are broken. If you're on the precipice, you're in a relationship, you have a chance to start it off with amazing guardrails that keep you right in the center of his will and will save you so much heartache. There's a lot of people older that are nodding right now. We could go back and change the thing. If we had the courage to let this be our guide. So today, when we pray, we open up the altar. If you're new here, we don't bother you. It's not like the crowd of people is going to descend on you and say, what are you praying for? Just a quiet time between you and the Lord. You want to kneel. You want to pray for your marriage. Maybe you want to pray for your spouse or your kids or your future kids or grandkids or that person that God has not yet revealed but may be in the wings. This is your time. Maybe you want to make right where you are standing. Maybe you want to make that an altar. Maybe you want to kneel right where you are. You want to sing and just worship one more time and thank God for the blessings that he's shown us when he was willing to lay down his own life. Because greater love has no man than those who lay down a life for another. Love is about sacrifice. Let me pray for you, and then we'll open the altar. God, I thank you for your divine presence in this place. I thank you for your amazing example. I thank you for your word that is so timeless and powerful and is just written for today's headlines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God, would you speak to us in these moments? We lay our cares at your feet because your word says we could to cast our anxieties on you because you care for us. So receive us, Lord. We open our hearts. Holy Spirit, speak to us now. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. The altar will be open. The words will be on the screen. Just be obedient to whatever God's laying on your heart.